Welcome back, everyone, to the De Nicola Center's Winter Conference, We Belong to Each Other. The following panel conversation is entitled, I Was Thirsty and You Gave Me Drink, What We Owe in Hospitality. This panel is probably going to run until about 3.15 p.m., so make yourselves comfortable. My name is Anthony Monta. I'm the Chair of Humanities at Holy Cross College, a little Catholic liberal arts college right across the street from Notre Dame. And I'm delighted to serve as the moderator for this panel. Our topic for the next hour is squarely in a tradition, a happy tradition established by former Center Director David Solomon, um, recently reaffirmed by Professor McIntyre, and carried forward by Carter Steed, namely that this is not just a, an academic unit, but a hospitable place. And I wish you could see actually around me you're seeing this backdrop, but, but I'm actually surrounded by books in a room. This is the Jacques Maritain Library, uh, and it's a wonderful place to be. But I think the larger image, the more encompassing image of the center is that of a really exuberant table or hall where major ideas about ethics and culture can be discussed as if they were breaking bread and therefore, and thereby, this is the link that I think is really important because this happens, we can find ways of building a, a better and more fully alive human community. But these days, as we know, given that we're talking virtually, um, faith in this image may be a little vexed. You know, hospitality has to do with extending this feeling of home to other people in, in various tangible ways. But with lockdown policies, the hospitality industry has been affected our homes, which we love to have open for dinner parties and, and all of the rest of it, family visits, celebrations, we're told to be closed. Our language, even this language of social distancing and quarantine is, to my mind, has confused some things and made oxymoron sound almost normal. And yet we're trying to help each other and care for each other. And so part of this vexation that we may be feeling these days has to do with our natural sense that hospitality is connected in a deep way to providing comfort, to safety, refuge. And it used to, it used to be, for example, normal politeness to when somebody comes into your home, you offer them a drink, particularly in the evening. And the implication is that anyone outside your home, however you define that space, is a thirsty traveler. And I don't know about you, but I find it really pleasant to think that you can you can drink anything, water or medicine or, or wine through a mask. You can't. You have to take off a mask to do that. And I know the issues surrounding this are complicated. So to, today, to help us reflect on them, are three really remarkable people. Each panelist is going to offer some opening comments, and they'll have a conversation between them. But at any time during these remarks or the conversation, you're free, you're free to click on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit a question to me, the moderator. I'll collect them and I'll pose them to the panelists after the conversation. So first, today, we have Betsy Fentrist. She is the co-author of Almonds, Recipes, History, and Culture, and the Bryant Family Vineyard Cookbook. A professional writer and editor, Betsy, is uh, she earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri School of Journalism and spent time in the graduate English program at LSU in Baton Rouge, where I was, Betsy. I, was, I taught there for a few years. She lives in University City, Missouri with her husband, Sam. Next, we have winemaker Alex Pitts. He is co-founder of, Alex, correct my pronunciation if I get this wrong, Metra de Chai. In Chai. Chai. Okay. But close. There we go. Met, but I got Metro right. And you got that one right. That's the key. Yes. Metro de, de Che in California. He began working at rest, in restaurants at the age of 16 after moving to San Francisco. Worked as a chef at Napolito, Aqua, Cab, Wine Bar, Ciro's, everywhere. Cyrus okay. and the French Laundry. In 2012, he left the kitchen to immerse himself in the production of wine and has worked with Abe Scherner, our third panelist, as his assistant winemaker, building some of the early wines of Metro de Che on the side. And last, we have Abe Scherner, the founder and winemaker of Scoli or at the Scolium Project. 
Abe earned his doctorate in philosophy from the University of Toronto and previously served for nine years as professor of classics at St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. After taking a sabbatical from academia in 1998 to study grape growing, Scherner made the leap into winemaking, and he later launched an exciting and experimental uh, project called the Scolium Project, which earned him the profile in the New York Times as the fearless, I think it's the fearless, and not just a fearless, a, but I think it was the fearless, risk-loving winemaker. So the order of the remarks, uh, ju this just came in off the transom. Um, Abe Scherner will go second. Um, so perhaps we should have. Sorry uh, for the change, guys. That's all right. Perhaps we should have Alex going first. Yeah, sure. That's fine with me. And then Betsy and, or I'm sorry, then Abe and then Betsy. Thanks so much. Yeah, great. great. Well, this is going to be a little bit different of an approach, and I'm happy that we're going to keep our remarks somewhat shorter and open up a little more dialogue between us because as we've all become accustomed to Zoom over the last year, listening to a uh, talking head on the computer for 45 minutes can be a little daunting. So I'm going to just give a small sort of snapshot of the year from the perspective of a small winemaker and talk a little bit about the sort of system in which alcoholic beverages in general are moved and sold around the country. This um, has definitely been quite the year for drinking, as we all have seen. We can all think back to March and April when this phrase quarantini became this sort of catch-all for that cocktail in the afternoon during lockdown. And the numbers initially show a pretty major spike in drinking across the country, especially in the Bay Area where I live. By the end of March, drinking in the Bay Area was up 42%, and wine sales in particular were up 66%. But that doesn't quite tell the whole story. While retail wine sales grew about 16%, that wasn't nearly enough to make up the loss of wine sales in bar and restaurants, which, according to Nielsen, we would have needed to see about 22% to match 2019 total sales of wine particularly. But actually before the lockdown, the wine industry was looking pretty grim. It actually had its worst year in sales in 25 years. Sales were down 0.9%. And while that doesn't sound like a lot, since 1994, we had never seen wine sales drop. And it's partly that that interest amongst young people was being pushed in another direction. And that is this explosion of this hard seltzer market, which definitely took a lot of that away. Hard seltzer, according to Nielsen, had 193% sales increase in 2019. The brand White Claw, which maybe is the most um, popular of that group, had a 289% increase in sales, which is pretty remarkable. And Mark Anthony Brands, the company that owns them, White Claw, that is, they claim to have made over $4 billion in revenue from that product alone in 2020, which is pretty remarkable. So it certainly has been the, the year of hard seltzer. And for those who may not know, hard seltzer isn't seltzer at all. It's actually a product that is fermented from malted grains and then is carbonated, carbonated flavored, and then sweetened. So it's very similar to the products like Colt 45 or Smirnoff Ice or Mike's Hard Lemonade, which actually was Mark Anthony Brand's first foray into this market many years ago, which they did not nearly have the success of this rebranding it, calling it seltzer and conjuring images of drinking bubbly water that happens to have alcohol in it. But it, it is not that. So enough about stupid White Claw. But what I'm trying to say is that this increase in retail booze purchasing was certainly not felt equally by all. Large production wineries that sell primarily in supermarkets did great, but the thousands of small wineries who rely on restaurant sales and certainly tasting room visits were left sort of in the dust. The one big bright spot for the small guys like us was e-commerce. Before the lockdown, this is about a half of 
1% of an average winery sales. This year, online wine pur purchasing grew over 10%, which is a really big jump. And I can say for sure that is what kind of kept us afloat this year. And having that direct interaction with our consumers was something that we really hadn't experienced before. But of course, the biggest hurdle for that is shipping. And shipping wine is a very challenging prospect. You, as you can imagine, it's incredibly expensive. And for a lot of businesses our size who are too small maybe to work directly with a FedEx or a UPS, we rely on these fulfillment companies who warehouse and then pack and ship our individual orders, which is great and it offers a lot of flexibility and takes a lot of off our plate, but it's not uncommon for the materials and the labor to run upwards to 15 to $30, and that's just before it gets shipped. So all of these things start to um, add up, which obviously trickles down. And I, I empathize with the consumer perspective. I mean, I'm the first one to balk at a high shipping charge at checkout online when I completely realize it's probably baked into the product at some point. But I think the wine shipping world definitely was put in the spotlight this year because there was so much more e-commerce happening on, on wine websites and then places like wine.com, which had a huge year this year. So it's, with that said, it's a reminder to all of us that wine retail isn't going away. I mean, it's still in a lot of ways is the best way to get wine. And for many, it's, you know, the supermarket is where, where it's the easiest place to pick up a bottle on your, uh, on your grocery run. The challenge there then is that the supermarket shelves are pretty much controlled by two or three companies with Gallo being the behemoth of the group and others being Constellation Brands, which owns Mondavi and Clos de Bois and even Corona Beer. And then the, the smaller of the three is the wine group, which is massive and owns things like Franzia and Cupcake and hundreds of other brands that we all know. Actually, Gallo just last week inked a deal with Constellation Brands for $810 million. And that deal was to acquire 30 of their lowest end supermarket brands. So that tells you a lot about where Gallo is putting their chips at the moment. And it's with the kind of sub $15 bottle supermarket blends. And the Federal Trade Commission actually had to come in and pare that down from 890 million because the deal was seen by the FTC to be a monopolization of the supermarket wine shelf. So, for example, Gallo would have owned both sparkling wine brands, Andre and Cooks, and both brandy brands, EJ Gallo and Paul Masson. So it's fairly safe to say that almost any bottle of wine on the supermarket shelf is coming from one of these big three producers. I going to switch gears slightly, but only slightly, then it'll, it'll make sense in a moment to kind of talk about the three-tier system. I mentioned before how our little brand, Maitre Deshaies, has never really dealt directly with consumers because from the beginning, we were always planning on being a distribution brand. And so what that means in the three-tier system is that we sell to a wholesaler and then they sell the restaurants. And with restaurants being the driving force of our sales, that was uh, something that fit pretty well for us. Then in this COVID times, where we're dealing directly with the uh, consumer and skipping that middle tier, we had to definitely relearn a little bit. So the three tier system, you may have heard of this term before, but by law in the United States, all alcohol is sold through a system in which the manufacturer sells to a distributor, and then that distributor with its own salespeople and its own sales strategies goes out and knocks on doors of bars and restaurants and sells your product. In 1933, the 18th Amendment was repealed by the 21st Amendment, ending prohibition. Yay. And with ending of prohibition, the, government's, the government wanted to address some of the problems facing the alcohol industry that led to that prohibition. 
a big problem in the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th was the tied house. So in, ter in simple terms, the tied house is any retail outlet that is beholden to a particular alcohol manufacturer for any reason. Where this was most apparent was in these traditional old timey pubs and saloons where large alcohol manufacturers would provide these establishments with low interest loans and free draft systems and even direct payments for exchange for a complete monopoly of shelf space. It wasn't uncommon for a distillery or a brewery to own every retail outlet in a certain area. So these establishments had zero incentive to offer any competing products and every incentive to both oversell and overserve those beverages to which they were tied. Thus, the three-tier system was born. In its, in its purest form, the three-tier system is a market regulation concept, whereby each tier of the alcohol manufacturer, wholesale, and retail must compl remain completely separate. So a distillery, winery, or brewery cannot own a distribution company or a retail outlet, and then vice versa. The purpose was to prohibit or at least minimize large manufacturers from being able to set up and monopolize an entire retail uh, outlet. A part of the 21st Amendment that repealed prohibition was Article 2, and that amendment gave each state the right to decide how and when they would repeal prohibition. And in doing so, it has led to every state having their own way of handling the three-tier system. On one side of things, you have Washington State, which actually in 2012 got rid of their three-tier system completely. That has allowed wineries to go directly to a retail outlet, such as Costco, and say, you know, if you buy a certain amount of X, we can give you a, a certain amount of deal. And that's pretty unheard of. It's the only state in the country that does so. On the other side of things, on the far other end, is Oklahoma, where Oklahoma, there's actually a four-tier system in which the brewery or distillery must first sell to a broker, then the broker sells to the distributor, and then finally to the retail outlet, which of course, everybody is wetting their beak along the way of that system. Then by the end of prohibition in, in the Northeast, the bootlegging operations run by some of our more nefarious organizations was a pretty well-oiled machine. Production, warehousing, distributions were all well in place at the end of prohibition. So they were in a great spot to have players in each tier of the three-tier system. And truly to this day, working in some of these markets like New York and New Jersey, Florida, and Nevada, you still see the remnants and ties from organized crime families from over 100 years ago. Each state having its own laws makes for a lot of red tape also. And I, I know Abe feels this as much as anybody. It's it's almost a full-time job just to keep up with each state's individual licensing and regu regulatory practices. And for sure, shipping wine is a whole nother uh, set of those licensing and regulations. So we're all figuring that out over this year. I, I hope I haven't painted such a bleak picture of the broader booze industry, but my point I should say at the start of this was to kind of show the sort of silver lining of that direct engagement with that winery or brewery or distillery that's special to you. Yes, paying for shipping sucks. And it's perhaps that we were paying for it in a different way before. But maybe I make a plea then in 2021 to try and go to that little wine shop or if not the wine shop, go buy from your favorite local restaurant. It's been such a great way to help those places out. Takeout food is great, but we all know that wine and cocktail sales is what really keeps restaurants in business. So call them up, uh, try, and get, try and get their wines that they were already buying and support those little places around you. Last year, I was on a panel with Betsy urging everyone to stay home and cook. And I want you to forget all of that this year and go out and, and eat and buy from your local restaurants and wine shops. Thank you. You're here. Thank you, Alex. Abe, that's a nice segue into um, 
you, you're extending the perspective and, and, and taking it somewhere different. So why don't we hear from you next? It's such a pleasure to start slow, allow us to overcome any technical difficulties that are the result of my not having been able to charge my top last night and this morning. So I want to make sure that you can all hear me well. I'm yep. not getting um, not getting any messages from the control center to the contrary. Even though we can't be in the same place and we can't meet tonight for drinks and dinner, it really feels absolutely wonderful to be involved in this, even through the extremely strange mediation of my cell phone screen. I've been really honored to be part of this conference for enough years that I feel like I have developed what one might call a train of inquiry that I'm pursuing in the presentations that I've been making at the conference. And for several years, I've been thinking about the vineyards that I work with, but taking the opportunity of participating in the conference to think in a kind of I don't even know what to call it. My profession is viticulture to some degree, but to think about these vineyards, not in a viticultural way, but in a way that is closer to first philosophy, some kind of metaphysics, some kind of ontology. And what I pursued over the last couple of years is an inquiry into the nature of the walled vineyard. Some of the most important and prominent vineyards in the world that make not only some of the best wines, but the absolutely most valuable wines are walled vineyards in ancient places in Europe. And the walled vineyards were almost always part of a monastic environment um, at their beginning. It's not perfectly clear that the origin of the walls has anything to do with the very special status of monasteries and other cloistered environments, it's entirely possible that the impetus to wall vineyards is just similar to any other kind of means that human beings take to protect their property, but it's not clearly and simply only that. So I'm really happy to position the few things I'm gonna say about hospitality in the train of this ongoing inquiry for me, this inquiry into the nature of the walled vineyard. And so what I'd like to say, first of all, are several things closely related to what Alex has said. And it's worth saying that it was in a certain sense in my capacity as a host that Alex came to be part of this conference because Carter Sneed was in Napa, I think, for business, but I'm not for sure. Sure, it was for business. And it's not important because I invited him to my house for dinner in an act of love and friendship. It had nothing to do with business. Alex and I were already working together at the time, but Alex was in my home that night for the same reason, not for the sake of business, but out of love and friendship. And I would say as much fun as making wine, Maybe the very best thing that we ever used to do together was to cook and to host. And I gave um, Carter a task uh, in, a, in a kind of a remote part of the, we were probably cooking for 40 people that night, and uh, set Alex uh, on Carter as his guide and teacher. And in a certain sense, Alex had been inseparable since that moment. So I would like to continue with some of the things that um, Alex brought up in the following way. My business too, just like Alex's, has changed absolutely radically. And I used to sell a small amount of my wine directly to consumers through what we call a mailing list. And I would depend on a shipping company in Napa to box the wines up, hand them off to UPS. I never had anything to do with it other than reluctantly paying the bills for the service. And this year when um, restaurants all over the tree were shut down. I would say almost 100% of my business dried up right away. But also keep this that I love alive. It was 
going to be imperative that I figure out how to sell wine in a different way. And I looked at what some friends of mine were doing in Los Angeles and New York, some of them in with food, some of them involved with wine. And I saw how quickly they moved from selling what they, what was important for them to sell in a way, in some way call wholesale. What I mean is selling a lot of stuff in a way, putting it out there and, and, and set out like I saw them shift what they were doing. They started working with individual consumers and in, and in particular with both food and wine, bringing the food and the wine directly to their homes, handing the food and wine off in some kind of safe and contactless way. And I saw this happen with two or three or four days of the lockdown beginning in Los Angeles and decided that I had to figure out how to do the same thing. So we now sell something like 90% of our wine directly to consumers. We've taken over the UPS shipping ourselves. We have a UPS scale at the winery. And in a certain sense, it's our most important tool. Maybe the single most important tool remains the forklift, but the second most important tool is the UPS scale. It's absolutely amazing. And that's kept my business alive. And I, I think that I spend right now roughly half of my time making home deliveries in the state of California. I've driven as far away as uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, in order to make home deliveries. And I spend, uh, as I said, about half my time on home deliveries and on packing and shipping. And the home deliveries are absolutely wonderful. I get to meet people, see the looks on their faces. I know what the homes of something like 120 of the people who keep my business alive, I know what their homes look like. But it's very much worth saying in the context of this conference that I haven't been invited into any of those homes. It's not possible. It's not possible in this time, at least in California. And so the, what you might call the abridgment of holiday has changed my life radically. There are no dinner parties with Carter and Alex. Um, there's no being invited into the homes of the people that you sell wine to. They're still beautiful means of exchange, but they're so different. To return to um, what has been the path of my inquiry at Notre Dame over the last few years, the walled vineyard is contrasted with something else that arose at just about the same time as the walled vineyards and the monasteries, and that is walled gardens, known as the Hortus Conclusus. And the Hortus Conclusus was opposed to an open space, a Hortus Apertus. And in the last couple of presentations that I've made in Notre Dame, I investigated the relation between the kind of farming and winemaking that I'm interested in and the Hortus Apertus, the open field, rather than the Hortus Conclusus, the closed garden. The relation of this to hospitality is the following. When I was thinking about what I wanted to look at and speak about in this talk, my mind turned back to the cloister, the cloister, which is somehow the analog of the closed garden, the closed, uh, the walled off vineyard. The cloister is also a place very much like our homes all over the country now, where in a certain sense, hospitality is not possible, where yeah, ingress and egress are very tightly controlled. And you could say that the general mode of um, their structure or something like that is prohibition. In other words, ingress and egress to the cloister are simply prohibited. They're not even to some degree modified or um, doled out. Uh, prohibition, the simple impossibility of entering or leaving um, is, is the general or maybe the, the most fundamental mode of the relation of a cloister and the people within it to people without. The open field is something that has been very attractive to me in the world of farming. And it's a little, it would take a long time to tell you why, but what I'll say simply is what is attractive to me about the open field is in an important way different from 
what is really attractive to me about hospitality, but they, but they reflect on each other and they can shed light on each other. One of the things that we in what you might call field farming is we control things to the slightest degree. Not only do we not have walls, but we allow as much to grow what you might call naturally and spontaneously as possible. And we try to create a vineyard within that wild and spontaneous setting. One of the things that occurred to me in thinking about hospitality in relation to this and thinking about something like the impossibility of hospitality in the cloister is the following. I asked myself, in what way can you welcome somebody into a space that is the opposite of a cloister? In the same way that I've been thinking about the open field versus the walled garden, what if a home were completely open? It seems to me in some way obvious that what is essential to hospitality and to welcoming people is not only openness, but a kind of radical openness, an openness that where to some degree you submit yourself, or maybe to the highest degree, you submit yourself to the needs of the other. But I also thought, if your home is in any really fundamental and essential sense, completely open, in what sense is it a home? And another way to look at this and to ask about it is to ask, is it possible to have a home without walls and without a door or a doorway? And yet another way to think about this, to push the same question, is I guess instead of asking a question for me to assert something, and that is that a door and a doorway are absolutely essential to there being a home, not just for the sake of simply protecting it, but for the sake of defining it. And I'll, I'll go a little further with this. I think that the very notion of welcoming depends completely on there being something like borders, on there being the possibility of holding up one's hand and preventing entry. And one of the consequences of this, it means the cloister really has the possibility for a very deep kind of welcoming, precisely because of the important way in which it is shut off. I think I'll close by holding up an example of a very interesting kind of host who is uh, a kind of Central American image and who's tied uh, in the image to the world that Alex and I work in, the work, uh, the world of making wine, but also serving and consuming wine. I think of Gatsby and his parties, and in a certain sense, those parties were completely open. Gatsby's absence, not just as a warm figure interacting with his guests, but his absence as somebody who acted as a gatekeeper meant that there was no hospitality at those parties. There was no welcoming. It's a hard thing to accept right now, but I think an important lesson that the person standing at the door who in some way forbids entry is also the person who makes possible any welcoming, any hospitality. Thank you. Thank you, Abe. Last we'll have Betsy. And Betsy, let's also, we're at, we're at 234. You're, you're welcome to take 10 minutes and then we'll have a, a conversation between us. Um, and there are no questions yet coming on my Google Doc, but as soon as they uh, they come up, I'll I'll start letting you know after uh, during our our conversational period. So go ahead, Betsy. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you both, um, Alex and Abe. Um, I really appreciated both of your talks, and Abe, um, I will definitely piggyback on your phrase. Uh, radical hospitality. I also just wanted to say that the last uh, two and a half days, uh, I, I've seen these patterns where all the panels uh, are talking about um, kind of where we are in economics or care for the disabled, 
um, health care, the poor, the immigrant. And then we, we talk about how we failed these people. And then the third phase um, of the panel discussion seems to be, you know, how, how do we remediate some of this? And so um, I'd kind of like to follow that in, in the, the area of hospitality and especially in this phrase, the gift of hospitality. Because as I listened to all these panels, of course, my solution was, well, you guys just need to go have dinner and, you know, talk this out. Because a lot of it is people are not talking to each other. And Alistair McIntyre so aptly brought up that um, who are the people that are being left out of the table conversation? And so I want to talk a little bit about um, how hospitality is so important for kind of some of these uh, marginalized uh, people. Uh, if we're going to talk about the state of hospitality today, Alex did a great job on the ramifications in the wine industry. I was going to talk a little bit about um, the restaurant industry. Uh, they've lost 4 million jobs, 110,000 restaurants have closed, and 91% um, of the hourly wage worker, work, workers, largely women um, and people of color, have also lost their jobs. This is a this is a devastating thing to our economy, but most more important to you know the people that we love and and all the places that we love to go and, and patronize. And um, I I think that one of the amazing parts about the hospitality industry is how they have turned and helped their own. Our chefs here, Gerard Kraft and you know Danny Meyer in New York, the initiatives that they have done to take care of their own people. Um, Gerard, you know, they just turned around and fed the people that work for them, fed their families. And I thought about this when people were talking about McIntyre's phrase, um, networks of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving, and how we're all called to form those. So my answer to, um, I'll let the, these people each figure out in their own disciplines, you know, the nuts and bolts of it, but I feel like hospitality is the scaffolding on wh in which we start these really, really important conversations. And as I looked at the prompt and the word hospitality, the word hospital kept jumping out at me. And I thought, this is really strange because, you know, I want to talk about warm, you know, fuzzy hospitality. But the reality is that as one industry has been completely gutted and basically shut down, this other sector of our society has been ramped up and is just completely overwhelmed. But both of these words um, are rooted in each other. And as Catholics, we go back one step further um, because they're both rooted in the word host, which for us is our spiritual sustenance. So all three of these words are connected in that um, they're, they're all places and instruments of grace and they all show um, our independence on one another. We know the, the, the theme of the conference, we belong to each other and hospitality and, you know, in the hospital industry, those are perfect expressions of the depth of our, of our inter interdependence. Um, the next thing I just wanted to talk about was uh, the whole issue of immigration. Archbishop Gomez did a beautiful job talking about that. And, um, and of course, it fits so um, deeply into Alex and Abe's um, industry. And, and he talked about uh, what's the number one thing we can do for immigrants? We're gonna leave aside political and legal issues right now. And he said, is to get to know them. And you know, my first thought was, how do we do that? Well, we bring them you know, to our tables. And so hospitality, again, plays this key role. And not to mention that these people are largely um, what the backs of hospitality uh, industry has has been built on for so so many years. Um, the writer Leon Cass uh, has a wonderful book um, about hospitality and hungry soul. It's a lot more about hospitality. He has this uh, phrase um, when he's trying to talk about the roots of hospitality uh, in the in the Greek world and how the Greeks were nervous uh, to not entertain. And it says, um, what might it mean that the divine takes the form of the stranger or beggar? And uh, of course, Mother Teresa answered that call in, a, in, a, in her Christian way of saying, uh, everyone that came across her path was Jesus in his most distressing disguise. 
And so um, I just love the fact that the cast just talks about the importance of hospitality in the Greek world. And, and, and that is the beginning of hospitality. Um, in my own city right now in the pandemic, I, I wanna talk about a radical hospitality situation of a, a young woman who has um, Shanna Jones. She's got multiple medical issues and she lost 11 members to the pandemic um, and family members and friends. And so uh, she said, you know, I, I'm a really broken person, but other people are broken too, and I need to do something. So she got a card table, she put it in her front yard, she got into her pantry and a refrigerator and she put some food out and she posted it on Facebook. And about 15 people showed up, but it went viral. And she's been serving about 300 families a week now for eight or nine months. And uh, the point of this is that hospitality, um, it's a seed that grows and people are now dropping all kinds of things off to her house uh, and she can't even come out. This, this, this isn't even around a table. She can only come to her front door and wave at people. But um, that's, that's hospitality and that is answering the call to hospitality. I, I'd like to juxtapose that with um, a failure to answer the call to hospitality in scripture. And uh, in the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, we have uh, St. Luke uh, giving us the story of Jesus and the apostles in a remote village all day long. And um, at the end of the day, the apostles go up to Jesus and said, well, it's time to send everyone back to, um, to eat and get provisions because, you know, we don't, we can't do this. And Christ answers in with one line, give them some food yourselves. And I love that. And it jumped out at me last week. I hadn't anticipated reading. It's a beautiful part about all of a sudden when you are doing a discussion like this, you, you look at, at your world and, and what you read more carefully. And, you know, their, their deal was, you know, sorry, uh, we don't have the gift of hospitality. And, and he was basically saying, yes, you do. We all do. And of course, he was the instrument through which they multiplied it. But um, he was just saying, you can't shirk your duty. And this phrase, uh, the gift of hospitality, I'm going to challenge it a little bit because I do think that people use it as a way to let people off the hook, or themselves off the hook. I don't have the gift of hospitality. Well, you know, it's just like, like Shona Jones. Everyone has that in them. And I think to answer the prompt, um, what do we owe in, in hospitality? We owe a lot because if the definition of hospitality is giving from what you have, then everyone has a unique way of doing that, and um, and it's 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 a command. I think it's a it's a command from the gospel. Uh, the last three popes have had a lot to say about hospitality um, in the context of of the theology of gift. And I'm, I'm just kind of starting to delve into this and I can't wait to spend more time on it because I think it's so beautiful. But um, Pope Francis last year in um, the week of Christian unity called for um, the, ecumen hos the ecumenism of hosp hospitality of ecumenism, where we share our faith and we, we receive other people's uh, differences in Christian faiths. And I, I just think that um, all of the, the idea to finally close, um, if the Eucharist is about Thanksgiving, then we all must start from a place of gratitude. And when you start from a place of gratitude, uh, you understand you've received a gift and, and what do you wanna do? You want to pass that gift. And to bring the cast quote for, full circle, um, I'm gonna end with a quote from St. Paul in the letter to the Hebrews. And he says, let mutual love continue. Do not neglect hospitality, for through it some have unknowingly entertained angels. Betsy, thanks. That was a great way to, uh, to end this, this part of the panel. There are a lot of um, connections between these talks, of course, and and but I don't want to obtrude. So Alex and Abe, if 
if you want to jump in and, and Betsy, if you're going to start talking to each other, um, that's certainly fine with me. If there was something burning that you wanted to follow up on with someone else. I, I, I love wanted... that we all have um, cooking in common. Yes. <laughs> and I was going to bring that up when Abe had mentioned maybe the most fun part about this whole thing is the actual act of just hosting and cooking for others. If there was some way I could just eschew all of the business responsibilities of my, of my livelihood and just focus on cooking and serving wine to others, that, that would definitely be the way to go. But of course, here we are back at the economic issue that is daunting and looming over all of these conversations. And Betsy's point is correct that a lot of the talks over the last several days have been about economics and they have to be, but I'm glad that we could somehow bring some humanity back to those affected. And that's why I'm so happy to have spoke today. It's just, there is somebody at the end of that chain that where those purchases are not being made and those restaurants are not open that are being affected. And it's, it's also reminded me of something Betsy just spoke of where we talked about getting to know each other's cultures and, and these, and having those interactions at the table, but maybe more importantly is going out and eating at these establishments. Um, I actually just recently moved to Sacramento, California this fall, and it has a really amazing and diverse Southeastern Asian community here. And it's been so sad not to get to go to these places and go inside and sit and talk to these people and eat the food. Cause food is almost always the easiest unifying thing that we have especially across cultures and different beliefs and backgrounds. And that is something I, I miss greatly about this whole awful year that we've had. I, I totally agree. And I, I think um, the kind of the apotheosis of this is, is not being able to, um, I mean, the worst part about the pandemic is the loss of life clearly. And, um, and the one basic thing that kind of makes a, a funeral you know, not bleak is, is the reception, you know, afterwards or getting together after the, you know, in, in my community, the wake. And, and it, you just feel, you feel robbed of this central experience of, of how to connect to people. Uh, and I, I just can't wait for it to be over. <laughs> but, uh, Betsy, let me, let me jump in with a question from, um, from the, uh, the ether. So this, mm -hmm. can, um, this might be a good one for you. This comes from McKenna Cassidy, who is a Soren Fellow alumna who now works with Gallo Wine Sales in New Jersey. And McKenna asks, you know, basically, what is holy about hospitality? You started to touch on this um, and you started to, to really get at the emotional content here. And I think you're sensing that, um, you know, there are connections here, of, of course, to, to scripture, but McKenna is asking about in the winery, in the home, vocationally, at the restaurant. Can can any of that hospitality now be holy? Well, I I think it can. I mean, I you know I can just say that you know we've one of the I, I have a, a good friend that I've I've done these books with Barbara, and one of the the things that we talk about is that in. Um, We've really discovered nature in our backyards in a way that we never would have. And um, that, I mean, I pay attention to the birds and the wind and uh, the weather in a way I never, ever would have. And there is a, a, a there's a holiness to that in me in, in understanding, you know, that God really does provide this outdoor room. I mean, you know, what Abe said, I thought about the open field was so interesting and the idea of, of doorways and what happens, you know, when we go through doorways. The, uh, John Tarkowski has a wonderful book about ph photography called, um, you know, about windows and, and just how we perceive things and how we perceive people. And, and I just think 
that the main part about uh, the holiness to me comes from a forgetting myself. My my deep pleasure if I'm having um, an event, and I know that Abe and Alex will probably con uh, concur, is going into the doorway of my kitchen and just listening to all the chatter and the candlelight. And and uh, Madeline Lengel has this great quote about this: is just that 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 Kairos moment when everything gets elevated, and uh, you know. Babette's feast is all about the the holiness, the forgiveness that happens around the table when when people all kind of come outside of their their pettiness. And if I can add something um, that comes from what I feel like I, I learned in trying to prepare for for this for being on this panel. I think I was inclined to say in answer to McKenna's question that what's holy about hospitality has something to do with openness. Well, in a, in a way that's obvious, and I don't mean that it's obvious in a way that undercuts the truth of it, but it it's not the whole story. In other words, there's something really important about, uh, about there being doorways and gatekeepers and, um, Maybe my short answer for the way that I would get at the relation between holiness and hospitality is to begin by emphasizing the importance of things being closed off, which then the the yeah the 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 necessity of of there being barriers and defenses. And then what is holy is in the face of that necessity, opening oneself up, not a kind of openness that's just like the sea flowing, but something that is deliberate and that requires a human being to hazard something in order to open up. Could, could I interject something from Ivan? Who is, who is writing um, from the internet. He is watching and, and he wants to, um, to ask you, you guys to reflect a little bit on being outside and in the open field. And it, Ivan asks a question about um, the field, the soil, in defining the role in God's hospitality of the stranger, specifically of Ruth, the foreigner. He goes on to say is, you know, there's something... It, uh, about this moment in which he feels creation may be extending hospitality to us. And so if we're getting outside, if you're being out among all of those um, natural processes, I, I guess this is kind of a question for both you and Alex. You know, if, have you had any experiences this past year where you're outside in that open field and yet still feel like you have a you have a sense of a door or you have a, a sense in which you're part of a hospitable creation. That's a pretty leading question, but yeah. I'm, d I'm just wondering whether, you know, what have your experiences been like outside and maybe can you connect to, to Ivan and tell him, you know, how that, how that makes you think? Well, I'll, I'll take this a, God, I hate to be the bummer all day today, but here I go again. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> I was actually thinking about this this morning. I was thinking back to harvest and how we spend a lot of time outdoors. And actually, there were several weeks there where you could kind of live like there wasn't necessarily a pandemic around you because it's me and the two or three people I spend the most time with out in these vineyards, working outdoors all the time, not necessarily needing masks and the like. But at the same time, we had these fires raging around us. And as I was thinking about that, here we are wearing masks again, not to protect from the SARS COVID-2, but from smoke. And so there was one night in September where we were picking Cabernet in the middle of the night. And I wish I could show the photos, but it looked like a snowstorm of ash. And we were all 
wearing several layers of PPE trying to get this fruit off of the vine. And it was a pretty horrific night of trying to get these grapes off of the vine ahead of this fire that was going to move south towards this vineyard. And it was this kind of friend effort where we called on anybody we could to come help and pick grapes all night under these big lights and and we got it off and we'll see what happens with the wine we don't know it's likely that it could be a complete loss because the smoke actually that lives on the grape skins will affect the final flavor of the wine but it's unfortunately one of these things you can't track really well there are testing practices that can happen but they don't always show the long-term effects of what what the smoke taint will have on the wine. So maybe I bring this up just slightly as a, as, as one more reminder of the difficulties that small wineries had this year. And, you know, the, the fires in Northern California were truly awful and they lasted almost the entire harvest, which was really, really difficult. I have, I have something I, I can add. We're really fortunate in Southern California, there, there were fires also, but there were almost no fires that were close enough to vineyards to cause smoke taint. But there was enough ash in Los Angeles to make it feel extremely strange to be, to be here. Even in Santa Barbara, right on the coast, there was so much smoke coming from fires inland that the sky was not a natural sky. And in a certain sense, the world did not seem hospitable. Uh, the fact that we were in danger, the hands of a microbe that can be passed from other human beings was bad enough, but you couldn't even look up to the sky for solace. Mm -hmm. It was a terrible time for a month or so. The solace that I've had this whole time during the pandemic is a very interesting vineyard that's also at the heart of this question of the open field versus the closed field. It's the opposite of a walled vineyard. Um, it's, a, it's a vineyard that was abandoned for 50 or 60 years and not only doesn't have walls around, it's kind of hard to say where the vineyard begins and where the vineyard ends. It's so much a kind of continuous part of the land around it. But that's not what is interesting in relation to this question. The vineyard is on a Native American reservation that was actually established um, in a certain kind of legal way before California was a state in the union. And in order to access the vineyard, we have to go through a security gate with an armed guard. And that's because of the history of this space, the reservation within the community around it. And it's a very, very interesting passage to access this completely open, very beautiful natural space that's really important to us, but to have to go through a gate with an armed guard to get to it. There are other questions coming across the transom which have to do with the fragility of um, hospitality in a number of ways. One of which also is is to come back to is to come back to Alex too and, and the idea of economics. So one student is asking a, a, a pretty this is a good real question. Okay, how can we be hospitable, particularly in the area of drink? Um, on a tight budget. <laughs> what are, you know, we all know, we know, we've all been to the supermarket and, and the, uh, and have seen the wine wall. And, uh, and Alex, I think your assessment is pretty sobering um, about the, you know, what's going on there at the, at, at the bottom end of things, but, but yeah. help a brother out, you know, what's the, uh, what, what's the best approach to, to interacting with really great small producers and people sure. who really care about, about the wine world um, and being hospitable that doesn't break the bank. 
Yeah, I get it. I, I first want to start off by saying uh, sorry to McKenna. And I'm not not trying to uh, to uh, call you out there from from Gallo. But um, so in general, I think we make a lot or we make too much about this pairing of food and wine and things. I I am much more in the camp of maybe tighten the budget on the uh, menu items, go with something very inexpensive. And, you know, it could be refried beans and rice and tortillas, but then spend the extra $10 on, a, on the bottle of wine. I often think you'll have a better, more enjoyable uh, memory of that meal with the, uh, you know, go spend 18 or 19 bucks on that bottle of wine that might be from a producer that you haven't heard of or from, which is always, almost always the best way is to just ask the advice of the person that you're buying it for. Because if you can somehow get that person who actually purchased it in the first place, whether that be the person at the wine shop or what, like I was saying with the restaurant, maybe that manager or that wine buyer who actually, you know, went and sought that thing out. So that would be my advice. I mean, there, there is no golden bullet of getting around the economics that are of making small wines like ours that, you know, we just have to, uh, to contend with the fact that it's, it's, a, it's, it's an expensive product, unfortunately. And we all definitely try our best to uh, pare that down, but that would be my advice. Maybe spend the extra seven bucks on the bottle of wine rather than the 15, go up to 25 or something like this. And then with the food, you know, don't take it so seriously and have some fun there. I agree absolutely and completely with Alex. It's, it's in a way a really good thing that good food can still be relatively inexpensive. You can, you can eat and serve really wonderful things that cost almost nothing to prepare. The same is just not true with wine. I think I might differ with Alex in this way. I can I can completely imagine how even fifteen or twenty five dollars fifteen. I was going to say fifteen to twenty five dollars on a bottle of wine could be too much. I don't I don't know how you really drink any anything decent much below fifteen. But but it's first of all not impossible, and second of all it is worth saying something about just the spirit of being together and what can come of offering something, even if it's a $10 bottle of wine and dividing it between you and your guests. I have been, um, I have, I have opened some special bottles alone since the pandemic began and I'm, I've enjoyed them all and I've been grateful for the experience that I've offered myself, but it never feels right. It never, ever feels right. There's just no question that we buy these bottles in order to share. And for me, it's worth remembering that that means that the sharing is the most important thing, not that it was a special bottle. Mm -hmm. And so that suggests to me that one can take a $10 bottle off the shelf in a grocery store and in the right spirit, it can be part of a special gathering. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. It's been interesting to me to to read a bit about the neurobiology, about how the the brain um, uh, recognizes tastes. So it turns out, to make a long story short, that the brain recognizes tastes uh, by pulling them uh, by pulling sensations into and collocating on sensations with memories. But it it uses the olfactory bulb in your brain, much like um, pixels on a screen. So your brain recognizes tastes by, by the same mechanism that it uses to recognize faces. Hmm. And so there's something profoundly personal about taste that is that connects, I think, with the idea that a, a lot of us have, that we want a personal connection to the people who are making our food and who are making our wine, that the community that we feel is related to that proximity. And so, Alex, I think you're making me a little more hopeful that 
you know, the, the connection between the producer and the consumer is, going to be, is becoming more direct as a result of all this. But also the, you know, the, the, the product itself, the, the wine itself, is more richly experiential for us because it has this, it connects to these qualities that have to do with recognizing faces and persons. So I don't know that how that how far that gets us, you know, in a in a conversation um, such as this. But I think there, I think that's related. I think one of the great ironies of the pandemic is that one of the long well um, side effects of the coronavirus is the loss of taste and smell. And, and you know, it's it's just kind of bizarre um, that. It, it, you know, on top of everything else, it wants to rob you of, you know, the ability to taste. Which is robbing the ability, you know, to, uh, which is affecting, you know, our ability to perceive persons in a kind of strangely metaphorical but biological way as, as well. Well, if, if I can that... chime in and, and just report something from Alex and my experience as as winemakers, outside of questions of hospitality, it's just related to what you introduced, and it's super interesting to me because when Alex and I used to work together in the same place under the same roof, and we judged wines, I, I remember I have the fondest memories of standing around with you, Alex, and thinking and talking about wines together. And I'll say that I think that one of the things that characterized the way that we almost always assessed wines is we assess them as a whole. In other words, in the same way that one thinks about faces, and that had never occurred to me before. Yeah, it's really, um, it, and it's ironic too, because the, the process of making a lot of wine these days is so finely, it, it is so hot, tightly, con um, not tightly controlled, but so completely controlled you can you can break things down into constituent parts so easily and reassemble them that the the whole then becomes a sort of what's what's creating the whole is a brand image or a, a sort of technical spec sheet instead of this more holistic process or a more personal process that reflects the maker him or herself hmm well here is another question for you all um the let's see we have questions from corporate cabin attendants in the private aviation industry we have somebody running a small b and b um let's see but as we come closer here towards the end i want to see if there's a a question here that is summative in in some way um well how about this a participant asks um, of Abe, but but more generally too. This connects to to, to something that I was going to ask at the, at the beginning. What are, you know, thirst is a word that occurred in 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 the title of this panel. What are people really thirsty for when they're coming for for wines from you guys? What is it? Really, you know. It's not just literal thirst, right? There's there's another ache, which Rich, Richard Wilbur, the American poet, put really well at the end of a poem called Alden Brook, and the ache that nothing can satisfy. And so there's a question here: how does how does all of this apply to human interactions in building friendships now? Should we have a door into ourselves which we choose to open and close to the various people we encounter? How do we, as people, sort of confront? the necessity of the hospitality as we come out of this pandemic. On a, on a temperamental level, I guess that's what we're asking here. Can I throw a uh, start by throwing out kind of a tidbit um, yeah. that uh, Alex apologized a moment ago for being a downer, but um, the whole reason why the industry that we love, the restaurant hospitality industry, the bar hospitality industry, is in such dire straits is because the way in which the shared consumption of alcohol 
causes openness in itself, an openness that is dangerous when the pandemic is still raging, much less dangerous and maybe something to some degree to encourage in safer times. Sure, and, and I I'm bringing bring up, up alcohol kind of... because in answer to the question about, about thirst, one, one can't forget that what Alex and I make has alcohol in it. When we're cooking, it's one thing. When we're making wine, it's another. When we're serving food, it's one thing. When we're serving wine, it's another. We can't forget that alcohol is an absolutely essential component of this thing that we're making and serving. Surely. And Betsy brought up earlier some of the numbers around what has happened to this industry that we really all love. And it's, it's a disaster, obviously. But I hope some of the silver lining of this is that we can maybe start to see that back to our talk on price, that there was some ugly parts of this industry that were very exploitative and the non-willingness, if that's a word, to pay for these things. I mean, I realize that it is, it is a lot to ask to go out and, you know, spend up 50, $60 a person to go out to eat. And it's, and it's a lot of money, but where that was being felt by trying to shave those menu prices down was really putting the burden in other places. And now perhaps part of this conversation can be moving forward out of this is that there, there is going to be a higher bill, hopefully, in some of these situations. And I say hopefully because, quite honestly, what made me leave that side of the industry, the professional cooking side, and get into wine was it is a it is a very difficult profession to um to get to live and the money is is challenging and you really do it for love but let's hope moving forward that all of this kind of gives us an opportunity to take stock and you know where your dollars go and where they're being felt in in a in a good way and here i am being a downer again but let's uh <laughs> That's what I would that I would say moving forward that the uh, hospitality industry can kind of reshape itself a little bit, and we as consumers who are so excited to go back to eat that we uh, realize that this is a whole community when you go out and uh, have dinner. I agree, Alex, and I just think that um, all of these are opportunities for us to look at the way people are treated. Um, and you know, as as we have to probably will retool our co economy as the idea of, you know, globalism versus you know buy local. I, I think that's really gaining some traction. They talked about it in the economic panel, and um, you, you know how it's it's like someone else talked about the nesting dolls of a society, and we're all you know we're a little doll in our family, and then there's our neighborhood and. And I, I think that that's a really important economic concept on on um, on how we go forward. Well, I, I was certainly inspired, uh, Betsy, hearing you talk about how it's even though um, things are difficult economically and complicated economically, there's still plenty of room to be creative. The, um, th there's no, um, there's no reason, you know, I remember early on in the pandemic, we had, we had friends in the front yard and of course we did our physical distancing, you know, but, but it was great at least, um, to have, we found creative ways of getting the food out in the middle of us, um, sure. and sharing things around. I've heard that people have wine parties now virtually where they all buy the same bottle of wine and then they get together on zoom meetings and taste and talk about, you know, talk about it with each other. It's um, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So a lot of these pressures and um, problems are going to, um, th they're not going to make this impulse towards hospitality go away. 
they're going to make it spurt out in some other direction that maybe we haven't anticipated yet. But I'm hopeful, um, as a result of listening to all of your remarks, that people in the industry and people involved in publishing and cookery, that they're that they're on it. They're on the problem. And um, so I'm sure that if if we were in a physical room, I would ask everybody listening to to give you all a round of applause. So so please do that, all of you who are listening uh, from the comfort of your homes. And I hope you did in, uh, open a bottle and, and enjoy something while you were listening to this. Um, Betsy, Alex, Abe, it's always a delight uh, to see people like you. Thank you very kindly for, for participating, but I think we have to wrap up now that it's 3.15. Sure. Thank you all for joining us. The next conversation will be the ties that bind recovering our social institutions. You see, you all just basically have primed the pump for that, that conversation. That conversation will be with Yuval Levin and Ross, I think, Doubt Dathet. Is that how you say his name? Alex, do you know? I don't. I always get it wrong because I want to be French and say Ross Duta, you know, <laughs> as if it were some chateau, but that's probably wrong. But anyway, Yuval Levin, Ross Douth at 4 p.m. Eastern time, the ties that bind. For more information and a complete schedule, you can you can go to the Denecola Center's website, um, ethicscenter.nd.edu. Thank you very much for joining us all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much.